Slowly but surely the world is dying, but who and what is to blame? The answer is carbon emissions, and our situation is a lot more dire than the average American may even realize. In New York's Union Square, two artists have recently released somewhat of a doomsday clock that counts down the exact time until the Earth's carbon budget is depleted completely. Originally, the clock shocked the nation by reading just 7 years, 101 days, 17 hours, 29 minutes, and 22 seconds. When we reach this point, it will be too late to stop the deterioration of Earth. So, what even are carbon emissions, and how did we get to this point? Carbon dioxide emissions, or greenhouse gases, are caused by a combination of natural acts and human activities. Every time we exhale, we release a tiny amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. It is this, in combination with human activities such as deforestation, land use changes, and the burning of fossil fuels, that cause mass concern and really increase our carbon footprint on the world. In addition, fossil fuels directly cause global warming and the lasting effects of this could be dire unless we change our environmental habits. Ever since the mid-20th century during the Industrial Revolution and Cold War time period, our carbon impact as humans has steadily increased, slowly deteriorating the overall health of the Earth. This period was even referred to as the Great Acceleration because of its drastic increases in fossil fuel combustion, carbon dioxide emissions, ocean acidification, and chemical pollution. This has directly led to the ecological crisis that we have found ourselves in today. In fact, since then, the burning of coal, oil, and gas, along with deforestation, has increased the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by more than 40%. The use of such fossil fuels is the primary source of carbon dioxide emission in the world and leads directly to global warming. Overall, though, our dominance in the use of fossil fuels has to do with two key things, energy and water imperialism. Energy imperialism can be directly attributed to the increase in demand for oil. Fracking to obtain oil for gas exports skyrocketed under the Obama administration. Since we no longer had regulations to limit crude oil exports, this caused us to be the world's lead oil exporter. In addition, our absolute dependence on oil makes it near impossible to decrease our usage. More recently, President Trump removed all of the regulations which led to a drastic expansion in product and infrastructure of fossil fuels. The U.S. is now the leading oil and natural gas producer, taking in over $180 billion as a result of their exports. Due to our blatant prioritization of capital over the environment, we have already suffered from a pipeline boom and increased carbon emissions exponentially. On the other hand, water imperialism can be attributed to a number of factors such as deforestation and large corporations acting without thinking of the consequences. Deforestation, which already contributes to climate change, disrupts the global water cycle as well as food production, which ultimately leads to events such as famines and migrations. Secondly, corporations and investors are buying up foreign farmland and water resources, leaving the U.S. in control. Water crises are also accelerators of violence, which essentially means that when the U.S. controls the tap, other countries or areas simply don't have enough access to clean water. Lastly, the U.S. has little incentive to work against climate change or to help increase water access because they benefit from these things by controlling whether, directly or indirectly, so many of these precious resources. However, at the same time, there are very real dangers besides access to clean water that affect everyone. It no longer matters where you live. No regional land, territory, or island is safe from these effects. In higher latitudes, people will experience increased storm intensity, drought, and heat waves. To contrast, one of the lesser realized effects that lower latitudes will experience is the exacerbation of inequalities. Because islands are obviously surrounded by water, they are most endangered by rising sea levels, but they can also experience loss of water towers, such as reservoirs in mountain glaciers. Now that we have more fully explained the carbon problem and the severity of the issue, the question becomes... What have we tried to do to fix these issues? Well, the answer is that we haven't done much. Even though the IPPC called for net zero carbon emissions by 2050, we have yet to enact substantial environmental change. They they did this to give us at least a 50% chance of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. However, since this announcement, we are no closer to achieving this goal. In fact, the US, in combination with Canada, Europe, Japan, and Australia 
currently account for more than 61% of total carbon emissions. If we continue on this path, we will continue to be on target to hit the trillionth metric ton of carbon. If we reach this mark, we will hit the 2 degrees Celsius or 35.6 degree Fahrenheit boundary by 2050. This could be dire, so we need to try to work on our carbon footprint and integrate practices to help the planet. First and foremost, we need to work on lessening carbon emissions, as this is directly related to the amount of future climate change. If we're able to lower our emissions, we can have less severe impacts of climate change. The most effective way to lower our carbon emissions is to switch to renewable energy, such as solar or wind energy, and reduce our use of fossil fuels. The EPA is currently taking steps to have common sense regulatory actions that limit the use of greenhouse gases. In addition, carbon geoengineering could be a possibility. Carbon geoengineering is a new branch of engineering that works to remove CO2 from the atmosphere by manipulating energy processes. We as individuals should also make efforts to recognize our own carbon footprint. For example, I took the carbon footprint survey as an average college student and discovered that if everyone lived like me, we would need 3.7 versions of Earth. Most people have three or more Earths and taking this survey will increase awareness about how we individually impact our planet. There are also steps we can take to reduce our carbon footprint. Project Drawdown, which is an organization working towards climate change solutions, has a table full of steps to take in order to work against climate change and carbon emissions. A few examples are biking and carpooling, as well as composting and switching to a more plant-rich diet. These are all steps that individuals can take to help reduce our impact on the planet. Ultimately, we have a decision to make. The doomsday scenario we described in the beginning is a possibility, but it doesn't have to be a promise. If we work together to hold ourselves, as well as our governments and corporations, accountable, then we will have the power to imagine a new future for ourselves. A future where we do not have to worry about the effects of climate change. A future where our children can enjoy the beauty of nature with skies clear of air pollution and waters free from oil. It is not too late. Since the start of this video, nine minutes has already gone by. We need to act now. And if we do, together, we can make a change.